Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second of three conversations about generative AI's labor impacts. My name is Aiha Nguyen. I'm the director of the Labor Futures Program at Data and Society Research Institute and curator of the series. Um, today, we'll be diving into the theme of recognition. I'll be your host with support from Data and Society and Ford Foundation's events teams. So for those new to Data and Society, for the past 10 years, Data and Society has worked to advance public understandings of the social and cultural implications of data-centric technologies and automation. Through empirically grounded research and inclusive engagement, we work to ensure that knowledge guides the development and governance of technology. This event is the second taking place during our 10 year anniversary season, and you can learn more about what we've accomplished and where we're headed on our website, datasociety.net. So um, for a little bit of background, generative AI seems to arrive seemingly overnight and has become a national sensation. But the narrative around this topic has often veered into the speculative, while workers who are experiencing the actual impacts aren't heard. So we've curated these series in order to surface these real stories and give space for others to join in this conversation. And we hope these exploratory discussions reorient the debate, um, help us build evidence, and to map new opportunities for workers. We kicked off the series last month with an online conversation frame to offer better understanding of what led to this moment and what invisible systems and hierarchies are scaffolding the current situation and uh, what might be coming next. And you can hear that um, online at our website. So today, second of their discussion series is focused on recognition. How generative AI might change how we see the value of work and shift who is recognized for which kinds of labor. So I'm thrilled to invite uh, to have our speakers Enango Lumamba Kasango, Sharife Wong, and Sarah Ziff join us for this conversation. I'll introduce our speakers. Dr. Inango Mumbamba Kasango, also known as Samus, is a professional rapper, beat maker, and assistant professor in the music department of Brown University. At Brown, she is co-founder and director of the Black Music Lab and a member of the Science, Technology, and Society Program Steering Committee. Inango serves as director of the audio at Glow Up Games and is a member of The Keepers, a hip hop collective, developing the most comprehensive comprehensive digital archive to map the contribution of women and girls across the hip hop's 50 year history. Yeah, give it up for her. <laughs> <laughs> Artist Sharife Sherry Wong leads Icarus Salon, an art and research initiative on politics, culture, and technology. Her work investigates AI, data, power, and belief. She is an affiliate at O'Neill Risk Consulting and Algorithmic Auditing and an affiliate research scientist at Kid Labs at UC Berkeley. She serves on the board of directors for a gray area in tech inquiry, is the culture and a governance lead at the Tech Diplomacy Network and is part of the San Francisco DJ Collective Brass Tax. Welcome, Sherry. And Sarah Ziff is the founder and executive director of the Model Alliance, a nonprofit research policy and advocacy organization for people who work in the fashion industry. There she established the first industry specific support line for fashion workers and played a leading role in assisting survivors as part of the Me Too movement. Sarah has successfully campaigned legislation to advance workers' rights and protections and is currently working to pass, pass the Fashion Workers Act in New York State. By the way, Fashion Week starts tomorrow for those who don't know, and I'm, sur I'm sure Sarah will talk more about some of the issues there. Uh, she received her BA from Columbia University and her MPA from Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to start off by asking each uh, speaker to share what your work is and the perspective that brought you here, and we'll start with Anango. Yeah, thank you so much um, for the wonderful introduction, and thank you to everyone who has facilitated um, our being here today. So I want to start by saying I am by no means an expert. I'm a hip hop head who is concerned um, about the direction that we may be moving in in the world of music, specifically for independent artists, artists on the margin. So that's the, the space from which I come sort of emotionally. Um, but I also am a science and technology studies scholar and a hip hop artist who's been performing under the name Samus for the past uh, 15 years, <laughs> 14, 15 years. Um, and so I have interest in this conversation from that level. 
Uh, but I also have a very sort of specific vested interest in that uh, in 2019, I started working with a game company uh, called Glow Up Games. And one of the things we wanted to do was to develop a kind of rap mechanic, um, a way to have people be able to engage with the fun and play that is rhyme creation. Um, and so one of my first tasks was to research and do some research and see what already existed in sort of the world of rhyme creation online and potentially in the game space. And so right as I was starting to begin my research, I think some of these developments around generative AI um, were coming to life. And I started to um, see some interesting things emerge. Um, some of you may be familiar with uberduck.ai, which is a tool that allows folks to um, use the voice of artists, um, so kind of like audio deep fakes. And there was a very viral uh, deep fake of Kanye West performing Bohemian Rhapsody um, and Jay Z sort of citing lines of Shakespeare. And I think immediately my spidey senses were activated around who are the people who are uh, becoming sort of the face of having their voices uh, be utilized by other people, right? And why is it these specific kinds of artists, why is it hip hop artists, why is it black hip hop artists, right, who are um, in many ways sort of the, the representation of what this uh, future space for music making and inhabiting other voices might look like. So that's sort of the space that I'm, I'm invested in right now is thinking about how these tools uh, specifically will impact the hip hop world. And I wrote a piece about it for public books. Um, and I'd like to write more sort of uh, thought pieces about this and be in conversation with these brilliant folks to think about ways to bring more artists into the conversation. Sharifa? Um, hi, everyone. Is this on? Okay. Um, so I work in um, AI governance and policy, but as an artist. So it's a little bit unusual because um, my work is sort of conceptual. I do research as a medium of art. And I got into the subject when I was working um, at an art residency at Autodesk, a tech company that makes software to design things. Um, I love technology and I love art, so I was coming to it from that place. And they had machine learning tools because it was a futuristic like workshop with robots and just 3D printing and laser cutters, any, anything you could want. And I got concerned over the use of machine learning because of the impact it was going to have on design. I was like, oh, this is going to, like, might take some jobs maybe. That was my first step into it. And I started hosting these dinner salons to bring conversation up. and I got more and more concerned as I learned and educated myself about like what consequences and the impacts on society would be because it was much broader than just labor too. Um, so I got obsessed with it and I um, wanted to learn even more and I ended up um, working on a big project with Stanford at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Studies. I mapped out the ecosystem for AI ethics and governance, all the different stakeholders. But I did it as an artist to widen it and broaden it and say, who are stakeholders, right? Because for me as an artist, every map is not a landscape, but a portrait. It's like what you're about. So I put in artists, I put in activists, I put in the worker movement as stakeholders because anyone who is not just using the tool, but if you have a tool that is used upon you or you're affected in any way, you have, a, you know, you should have a say, right? So I broadened the whole ecosystem there. And then I've just been working in it for a long time and I've been doing algorithmic auditing. And also I consider as part of my art practice or even sitting on panels like this. So I have all these um, broad concerns and, and landscape ecosystem concerns, but now because I'm an artist, it seems like I have all this more like lived experience on what these impacts might be like too. Sarah? Hi, everyone. Um, so I come to this conversation having worked as a fashion model. And often people, when they think of fashion, they see it as very glamorous. Um, labor rights issues are certainly not front of mind. Um, but um, And I, I was fortunate in my career. I worked as a face of big brands. But I also experienced the pitfalls of working in what remains an almost entirely unregulated industry, an industry that has a huge impact in terms of, you know, um, culture um, that's a multi-trillion dollar global industry. And um, so I uh, 
decided that we deserve, deserve to have rights and protections like anyone else who works for a living. And um, I uh, or originally was thinking in terms of trying to unionize the industry, um, but quickly learned that generally, you know, we're considered independent contractors, not employees, and under federal law in the U.S., that prevents us from unionizing. So I started thinking more about organizing. Um, and one of the first things we did at, at the Model Alliance was to um, establish the industry's only support line, uh, where we hear a range of concerns from various different workers, um, you know, models, content creators, hairstylists, makeup artists, um, photographers, and um, and in the last few years, we started to hear concerns in particular about uh, this emerging technology. Um, and I can you know, get into more specific examples of how it's showing up, um, but uh, we're talking about an industry that is largely unregulated, and I think over the summer, probably people you know, became aware of um, the impact that generative AI was having on creative industries because of the SAG-AFTRA and WGA strikes. But, you know, as workers who can't engage in collective bargaining, who are dealing with, you know, having almost no baseline protections as workers, it's, I think, particularly concerning and urgent for us. Thank you so much. Um, I think I'd, I want to maybe get a better sense of the industries that you work in, because I don't think I know that much about the fashion industry, or the music industry, or the art industry. And maybe we can start with Sharife. Um, sort of what do you see as sort of the reductionist nature of AI and art? Um, or how do you see it affecting the jobs and who might be those people that would be uh, affected? So um, the arts industry, I because I'm a conceptual artist, I think everyone is an artist, you know, and everything is art. Yeah, and I like to have that container really large. And just, for example, my own like career, I have been uh, like the assistant editor at Art Ma Net Magazine, right? I worked at the art galleries, like the receptionist, I like curated, I um, uh, you know, sit on the boards of things for art. I like give out grants. I apply for grants. And I'm part of like um, like 20 art, different art communities, like Burning Man art communities, tech and art communities. Like I've done drawings for um, you know just for making clip art, right? So production of culture is really really wide and also very um, precarious because you need to have like 300 jobs if you want to work in the arts, you know. So um, the reductionist quality is, I think, when is this lack of understanding and education art and lack of respect that we've always had for the arts because it, a lot of times people see it as a product and it's like just an image or just an illustration or a market thing, a commodity you can buy and trade because you're part of the art world, right? And it's not seen as much as um, labor and it's not seen as much as um, communities and the way that you connect with people and the stuff that's harder to describe that you can't just like exchange or have a transfer. So we equate that and it's, it reduces it. And the same way like data reduces like the real world. You know, you have all this like stuff and then you have to make it spit into a spreadsheet so that it becomes legible to a machine. So because we have this like lack of understanding of what art is, we, can make it fit into the spreadsheet, fit into the machine. And it, there's all the stuff, all these gaps that happen that are lost. Anango, you want to step in there? I see you run into <laughs> ready to say <laughs> something. Yeah, yes, yes, yes on everything. Um, so I really love this question because I realized a few years ago, I didn't know how any of my artist friends made money. Like we all lived in different universes. I have friends who, are, who work in theater, people who work in dance. Um, people who are visual artists, and we all were sort of like poets, writers, people, we were like piecing it together, but I didn't know how folks were doing it in their respective universes. So I just appreciate having this space to hear more about what on the day-to-day -day it actually looks like. So from the, the musician's standpoint, there are, are a few avenues through which an artist can, can make money and try to build a life. Um, one of those is through being a composer, so being like a songwriter or um, composing sort of music, uh, writing lyrics, being a songwriter in that sort of capacity. 
um, and another is through performance. Uh, so when we think about when we're hearing things on the radio, folks are getting paid every time that song sort of is, is spun. Um, and that happens in sort of a live music context as well. Um, and because uh, streaming has sort of disrupted the sort of payment models that existed prior to sort of streaming being really dominant, uh, the touring world has become kind of the most important universe in which artists are able to, uh, musicians are able to build a life. Um, so when we think about streaming, Spotify, for example, just recently kind of made the announcement and the change that um, they were going to, for any artist who has fewer than a thousand streams um, over the course of a year, they will not be paid for their streams. Um, and already the streaming model was operating on a sort of uh, like third of a cent per stream model, right? So you can understand, I mean, you, you may have a song that's streamed millions of times and uh, be receiving a check that's maybe in the thousands. Uh, so it's really, it's an incredibly precarious space to rely on those models for building a life. So a lot of artists are touring. Well, it's been a disaster for touring over the past few years for obvious reasons. Um, venue closures, but also uh, kind of monopolies around who owns venues, right? Ticketmaster charges a lot um, or takes a lot of the, the sort of percentage of fees uh, in, in ticketing. So. The avenues that artists are thinking about, um, I think we're already confronting sort of AI in terms of the, the algorithmic power of streaming models and how that shapes what we're listening to and who we're drawn to. Um, but I'm starting to be more concerned about the sort of maker space, the space where folks are actually like the creative space before it even reaches us. That's the universe that I'm I think uh, worrying about the most because I think about uh, educators, right? That's one avenue that folks are able to pursue, myself being one of them, uh, if and when it is untenable to be sort of a working artist in other capacities. I just received an email from a, a company called Studio where they do kind of online classes and they're proposing an AI music school, <laughs> right? Um, and so immediately it's like, okay, well, where are some of the other spaces? Session artists, right? You can perform pieces for other artists. Um, but there are tools uh, that can enable musicians to kind of build uh, musical pieces without having to necessarily work with other artists or performers uh, through generative AI modeling. So again, many of the avenues that I think have historically been a possibility for artists to, to like build some kind of life are being closed off. And I'm really interested in the kind of cultural imaginary, like what, as, as you were saying, like what do we think of as being the role of artists? When we started this talk today, there was music to play us in, right? There's a, a, an affective labor that's so critical for how we navigate the world that is often just sort of um, completely invisibilized or um, inaudible to many of us. So I worry quite a bit um, about how these structures will continue to, to uh, create a system where we see that labor as easy, right? Or, and because it's easy, it's not valuable, or because it's easy, it's not uh, worthy of being compensated. So I think it's, it, in the sort of cultural imaginary, I think there's a real capacity to shift even more the sort of disrespect that we often see artists managing on a daily basis. Thank you. Sarah, I think you, you kind of hit on the word like, uh, that it's supposed to be easy to do modeling, but I think you and I have talked about it's a lot more than that. Can you explain a little bit about the industry, what that means, and who else is involved in this industry? Sure. Um, well, so whether you're a model, a content creator, uh, um, a stylist, a photographer, you're, you're generally working through a management company, um, and uh, these management companies are unlicensed, unregulated, um, and yet exert a huge amount of power and control over the working lives of the people they represent. And so um, as the talent, you don't see your contracts or agreements with your clients, the brand, whether that's you know Macy's or Calvin Klein or uh, Vogue magazine, you, you, there's no transparency, um, uh, which is concerning with respect to having insight into one's own finances, but also, um, you know, when it comes to generative AI, um, there's really no way to have transparency or, you know, consent to the 
use of your digital replica, and that's something that we're really focused on right now with legislation here in New York. Um, I could talk a little bit about some ways that I see it showing up, uh, th th uh, th this technology showing up um, and its impact on our community. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll give some concrete examples. So Eve, a model, she's a fit model. For those who don't know what fit modeling is, it's you are the body that the designer um, builds their collection on. Um, and, uh, and she raised this issue a few years ago that she and other fit models were, ha were undergoing these 3D body scans and didn't know how their scans were being used. Um, and so in the, AI, in the age of AI technology, they're concerned that their biometric data could be used to generate avatars that essentially replace them. Um, uh, another example, Shireen Wu um, is a, a model on our worker council, um, and she's you know new to the industry, was just breaking in, and walked uh, in a runway show for exposure, not money. So. Um, a lot of people assume people are making tons of money. Often you're not actually getting paid money at all. Uh, you're getting a t-shirt, a tank top, or just like the privilege of appearing in a show. Um, and so that really added insult to injury when um, the designer published her image, uh, but she was unrecognizable because her face as a Taiwanese American woman had been replaced using generative AI to appear white. Um, uh, another example uh, is um, a model, Robin Lolly, Sports Illustrated swimsuit model whose digital replica is just sort of out there being used without her consent or compensation. And then finally, the, the, the last way that we're seeing it show up is, um, is anyone familiar with Shudu? She's the first um, uh, black supermodel who um, you know has been the face of big brands like BMW and Louis Vuitton, but um, critics have called this a form of digital blackface because Shudu's um, a black woman and her creator is a white man who profits off her image. So it raises really thorny questions about race and representation. Um, so that's sort of that, those are the, the the issues that are affecting the faces of the industry. But of course. Um, it doesn't just affect them, it affects um, you know, the whole creative team, photographers, makeup artists, hairstylists. We're seeing this new world emerge um, that replaces photography, um, which is a collaborative process and involves a team. Um, I wanted to add to that because it's very similar in, in visual arts as well that um, the harms from these tools are really unevenly distributed, right? Because like we have Chelsea da over there and those galleries in the art world and you already have a name, you already have a reputation. Like what are the chances of those kinds of jobs getting replaced with, with tools? And so if you're higher up on the, on the totem pole of things, you're often um, male and white and come from a background of privilege, right? But like imagine in all those Hollywood movies that you see at the very end, you've got the credits, the thousands and thousands of names that are located over in South Korea, they're all over the world. And they're just changing like the yellow car into a blue car, you know, and that's also a visual labor. And those jobs are a lot more, um, you know, destabilized by these tools. Yeah, thanks for pulling that out. It definitely feels like there's an equity question here. Like these tools, much like algorithmic tools and others are not gonna be equally applied. Um, but I wanna, like a follow up question would be, it seems like artists and creators give a, offer a lot of value to the industry, how would you describe how they shape the industry versus the assumptions made by developers? And we sort of got to the and, and others about what is valuable and why and what is the concern for you in industry about these technologies kind of redefining what's valuable in art or how you can define art. Go ahead. Yeah, so I just to kind of I think we're already sort of in this space in the conversation, but I'm really interested in risk and um, like creative risk, but also who can afford to absorb risk as an artist, right? Because being able to make risky art, risky in the sense that it's weird or abrasive or loud or uh, breaks the tools that we think of as being 
um, you know, working one way and instead working in another, that requires being able to absorb certain kinds of risk. Um, and so when we think about this sort of uneven distribution, the question isn't just who can't afford to take certain risks, it's who's completely locked out from risk altogether, right? Like who doesn't make a piece because they don't see the point because it will be swallowed up and or uh, the sort of systems that are regulating how that art arrives to us are so crystallized that it's not even um, sort of a question about whether there's a potential path forward for that to reach the folks whom they need to reach. So I think when I think about the value and the values that I learned coming up through the sort of DIY rap space, so much of it was about uh, breaking things and like creatively uh, building community through failure and like having the capacity and the space to fail epically out loud on stage um, in community. And so I think that the when I think about what's valued in these systems, right, it's it's efficiency, it's uh, being able to um, make a bunch of things that are similar to other things, <laughs> really, really well. And so in my mind, right, that's not that's sort of antithetical to how I'm thinking about what what risk taking looks like in these specific venues. So uh, I'm I'm really distressed thinking about younger artists who are responding to an who might be responding um, in some years to an environment where it feels like um, trying to innovate or say something weird um, doesn't have a place to live sort of in our arts ecosystem and so makes a different decision and I see this with my students all the time when they come to me and they say I want to do this thing but there's no future in it so I'm gonna do econ <laughs> which nothing against econ you know like econ's cool but they're they're already making this dis this distinction between what life will afford them the value you know that that they are desiring to to have a certain quality of life and it's heartbreaking to see them sort of hedging at that stage, understanding that this is the society we live in. We can't, you know, we have to be practical in some regards, but um, I do see this shaping that decision-making earlier and earlier and earlier in the process. Sarah? Ecom might not be the, the surest bet, unfortunately, <laughs> at least in our industry. I mean, so I'll give you an example. Um, some of you may have heard that uh, Levi's uh, announced that they were using um, AI-generated models to increase the diversity in their campaigns in terms of featuring more skin tones and body types. Um, and consumers are increasingly valuing diversity, so developers would probably see this as a positive step forward. Um, but the use of AI-generated models to address diversity issues is questionable and potentially harmful, um, especially when human beings from diverse backgrounds are ready and willing to work. Um, you know, fashion is already exclusive, and um, when there are limited opportunities um, for models of color, for example, to break into the industry using AI-generated models could take away these very limited opportunities that already exist. And perpetuate the systemic racism that has long plagued this industry. Um, uh, Levi's also uh, presented this, uh, the use of AI generated um, faces of the company as being more sustainable. Um, but of course, being replaced by AI is not so sustainable for the photographers, stylists, makeup artists, and so on, who rely on this work as their, you know, for their, to make a living. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for sharing that. I think you've also expressed that uh, fashion is also about expression. So if people are not the ones being able to express who they are, but it's simply a system, that's something that's lost there in that culture, too. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that at all. I only know this from what you've told me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I would say that fashion is a blend of art and commerce. And um, as an art form, it's Fashion is a universal, a universal language. Clothing is um, a form of communication. It allows you to present yourself to the world um, as your authentic self or who you want to be. Um, and that is kind of going back to what you were saying, inherently relational. Um, and 
you know, image making through photography has historically been a collaborative effort. It reflects relationships between the photographer and the, you know, model and the creative team. Um, and so if it's totally fabricated, um, you know, not painting with light as you do through photography or featuring real human beings, um, but it's simply pixels on a screen, then it becomes a different thing. And I think it becomes um, different from the human experience. Um, I think that, that brings us to, uh, that's a good segue into our next question. And uh, there is this idea that AI tools are fun and it's giving people, more people, the opportunity to be creative and make things that they enjoy. But I wanna dive into the question of what is art? Is it simply entertainment? Is it commerce? How, may, how could AI be reshaping art? And um, I'm gonna start with Sharife, since I know you've d done some uh, question, I tried to answer this question for a while. Yeah, I mean, as uh, every day, <laughs> I try to tackle that one. Um, you know, it reminds me of, and I'll tie into what you just said too. But um, about a year ago, uh, when the stuff first was like getting hot and on the internet, and people were talking about it, some tech guy on on Twitter, I forgot his name. He was, but now I won't out him. But he was like, "Finally, everyone can be an artist. These tools are like democratizing art." You know, and I was like, no one has ever asked for art to, be, like, I want to make art faster and cheaper. You know, like, that's not a pursuit, you know. But um, it's it was this angle because he's he's not, you know, he's, like, coming from this different thing. And um, this concept of democratizing that is a myth, you know, like, everyone was going to have access to these tools. They, they don't, first of all, right. And it's access through an intermediary, through a company, because it's a very centralized system. You might have tons of apps, but when it comes to the production of like what's dominating here, you've got NVIDIA making the like the stuff, the things there, the tangible components that you need. And you have a few, uh, uh, like three other companies, right? You've got like Microsoft and Google and, and, and Amazon. And those are the ones with the large data centers. So now, all of a sudden, in my, if, if that's what we're producing our culture and our art with, now these companies are sitting in the middle of that process, in get it, collecting the value from our creations. And it's, it's, it's kind of weird. And that community aspect of the relational aspect of like getting together and working on something is really lost because these systems where they're generating things and they've collected all the internet, they're, you're not connected to it. So like if I'm using a tool and I, like I, and I, I, I love text, so I've played with all of these tools, right? <laughs> like I, I love technology and I, I use them, I don't know where this image is coming from. But if I'm thinking about doing art, like I took this Islamic art class last year and like, how, cause I'm, I'm Turkish and I was like, let me get to my roots. And I learned how to draw in this tradition my teacher started the class off with her teacher's name, their teacher's name, this in the lineage of, I'm following these rules, right? And it's this algorithmic art form, I'm like, how cool. And I'm learning how to do it. And I know, and I look at the art, so I'm like, oh, when I'm drawing this cloud, I'm taking it from here. And I feel connected, because that cloud to me was like, coming in from like Chinese art, and I know it came from like the Uyghur people, and I feel very connected to them because we speak a very similar language. And so when I'm drawing in that way, I'm watering all these connections and feeling closer, right? And, and working on like being a humanist. But when I'm pressing buttons on the tool, being like, give me a cloud, give me an image, like, you know, in the style of Islamic art, I am not, I just receive, you know? And there's, it, it's a, it tears up, it breaks down these, these connective tissue that, that we have as a community. Go ahead, yeah, <laughs> please. Yeah, I, I would like to add, you know, that it's complicated, I think, for um, a lot of folks within the hip hop universe because the relationship that we have with tools and technology is uh, a very particular one, right? That like, being able to use tools and break them productively in many ways has enabled us to create the musical form that has taken over the entire 
galaxy. And I love that. And I have, have desired to sort of play with these tools since I was a kid. And one of the questions that I often receive is like, well, how is this any different from sampling, right? Like it's the exact same sort of principles. And I think to your point, when I think about the tradition of sampling within hip hop, it's about the connection, the intergenerational dialogue that's happening between different texts, between different songs, that in many ways, being able to locate the sample is the point, right? Like knowing where this thing came from is what gives it value. And seeing how someone interpolated that or freaked it or reworked it is a way that their ingenuity is in conversation with somebody else's. But with these tools, we're so disconnected. We have, I don't know where the thing is coming from, so I can't even be in conversation with them. Even if the conversation is to say, don't use my track for your, to sam don't sample my track, right? There are a range of conversations that can happen in, um, but this context completely precludes them. Sarah, do you want to add anything to that? Mm, I guess I would maybe add that I think the way it's showing up in our industry with companies, you know, using AI generated models as the faces of their brand and like using that for their diversity and inclusion initiatives, it this probably comes as no surprise, but it exposes that uh, the the idea that this is so superficial, right? Um, th that uh, there's, mm, you're just sort of like camouflaging um, rather than taking a genuine interest in representing the richness of the diversity of the people who are part of the creative team. Yeah, this hollowness in some of the art. And just so I'm, I'm going to insert myself into this conversation as someone who's a labor activist, I've been to plenty of events where you hear Rage Against the Machine or Tupac performing. And if it were generated by a machine without those individuals knowing the history of, you know, police violence or capitalist I impact on people, I think it wouldn't. I wonder if it would stir the same reaction in me. Um, and so I guess this comes to our last question. Um, how could these technologies benefit workers and creators? What types of uh, regulations or social understandings or cultural shifts are needed so that they actually are um, really generative for humans as opposed to, and it seems like what some of you are saying, becoming a tool for capital to scoop up a value? Go ahead. I'm happy to kick us off. I mean, we're not anti-tech, we're anti-exploitation. And um, when your body is your business, having your image manipulated or sold off without your permission is a violation of your rights. Um, so we have introduced a bill called the Fashion Workers Act um, that would address a whole range of concerns. Um, and we, we reintroduced the bill just a couple weeks ago with amendments regarding AI. And we're saying, um, we're asking for transparency and consent. Um, what we what we see is the bare minimum into the use of our image, um, and I and I think that I could imagine these tools being helpful um, and used in creative ways, but that like that depends on on people, you know, having having basic rights and transparency and 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 um, not being exploited by the technology. Sharife? Um, yeah, so I, I have so many answers to this one, but um, I'll try to minimal, <laughs> keep it minimal. Mm -hmm. But um, So I, I have friends who use these tools to like question the art itself and like reveal its bias. Like my friend Eric Salvaggio, he does work on um, where he's using the AI, but it just shows how biased the tools are as a way of um, educating people. I also have friends who um, have sort of teach people how to audit their own systems, like use these tools in order to like figure out um, what's going on and if it's representing your work correctly. And then I have an example from um, New Zealand that is a, a good example of, of good gov AI governance, in my opinion, of a, a group called Tehuki Me Media. And they, about, oh, I forgot, a few years ago, um, 
they had tech companies coming to their communities, their Maori community, um, and asking for a language because they wanted to do large language model training. And they saw it as another version of colonialism because it's like, you wanna come take our language and then sell it back to us later for, it was like two hours for $40 or something like that. So they, they um, went and spoke to all these other communities and they got together and they um, decided to manage their own and build their own large language model and they did and it's effective and they have their own rules and they have their own consent and everyone benefits and they collectively govern it in a form of like a data commons almost. So there's these other sort of solidarity and union things that are bottom up that don't necessarily have to come from these centralized top down ways of creating AI. But last I want to add that, you know, cause you hear it a lot of the time, like AI is not gonna take your job. So when using AI is gonna take your job, that is not true. You do not have to use these tools. You can also have not. In some ways, like, you know, like a lot of these tech tools are like a sieve, you know, it's like collecting all this stuff, you know, sieving the world, picking up all the data, grabbing all the value, like straining. And there's things that are just water and fluid that don't need to be made legible. There's private moments, there's all this other stuff that we do not want in a spreadsheet. And we have all these values and narratives, right? Like, Artists are always storytellers too. And so these big stories there, that are happening like this is what AI is, this is the next thing and we're gonna do this even though like we're you know, in the middle of climate change and the pandemic and like authoritarianism rising, this is what we're gonna do. No, you can change that story and you don't even have to use AI tools. You can just shift the narrative, you know? So if there's any other artists, you know, like you can put your work, you know, like just step out you can resist or just not use them at all and just continue your work in resistance. Um, and I will, I'll just add, um, in terms of the question around regulations or social understanding or cultural shifts, I would definitely say for everyone to follow um, United Musicians and Allied Workers. It's a group of uh, DIY, uh, mostly coming from the DIY music space who have been trying to build a kind of collective sensibilities about musicians as gig workers. Um, you know, to your point about being independent contractors and not being able to actually like legally uh, sort of unionize in particular ways, they are really being mindful about how we can still think about ourselves as being in solidarity with folks who um, maybe are able to organize in more structural ways and, and to um, talk about our shared kind of challenges. Um, and in terms of how the technology sort of benefit workers and creators, I don't have a, a ton of great examples, um, but I would say that it's it's been interesting thinking about what this tool, how this tool provokes us to maybe think differently about like skill um, in ways that I think other tools, um, particularly within the hip hop universe, have troubled that kind of distinction between who has skill and who doesn't, right? Um, when I think about what an auto tune first emerged, folks were so outraged, right? Like, oh my goodness, but like real singers are going to be kind of cast out because of this tool. And instead folks are, are breaking the tool and finding interesting ways to make it into its own sort of artistic expression. Um, so I think, you know, in some dream universe, I imagine that a tool like this, uh, tools like these could be helpful for helping us to think more collectively, um, that the expressions that we make are, you know, owned by us in some way, but are also connected to all the people who have inspired us and helped us to make bring that thing into being. So every song that I write is just as much my mother's as it is mine. It's just as much my teacher's as it is mine. And I think a sort of distributed knowledge system that's more transparent maybe could help us to start to think in those collective ways. Uh, but I don't sort of see that in these tools because there's not a sort of transparency there. But there is a, a promise, a potential there to help us to think more collectively because it is drawing on so many different conversations at the same time. Thank you so much. Those were, thank you so much for this interview. Um, it's time for audience questions. Uh, pose a question that was submitted in advance. Uh, what are your priorities as an artist? Does this technology support those priorities? Um, my priorities right now are always shifting. And right now, um, I want to sort of return home. I'm looking for like connection for where I came from, right? Um, and I am using 
AI in, in that kind of way because my uh, criticism of these tools is making me understand where I come from better because I'm looking into my Hawaiian side at the moment and I'm doing research on blood quantum laws, right, where they um, said, hey, if you're X percentage Hawaiian, you can get um, land and you have to be 50% or higher. And so for me, that is not just um, taking your land or, you know, so it's also kind of like an epistemic injustice where how do you know who you are is being under the control of someone else. And I see these epistemic problems in AI too with um, how do you know who you are? Well, these tools are now sort of integrated into like an understanding of the self and also cultural creation. And what does that mean? If they're dictated by not from my own community, not from my family of who I am, because once it happens, it's very hard to undo. Like, I am not connected. My family, I, you know, they had to leave. Like, my dad doesn't live there, so I don't speak that language, you know? But I speak Turkish because we weren't colonized. So there's these sort of separations that I'm, like, untangling that are related to AI and are related to self-knowledge. And I think our, we're going to see a lot more of as um, the next few years unfold. In terms of my, my priorities, I think um, right now what I'm really invested in is making process legible to folks who, are, who don't necessarily have a relationship or don't think they have a relationship with a creative process. Um, because again, through conversations with friends, it struck me that I don't know how the things that I marvel about that they create actually come into being. Um, and that having a relationship with that or seeing the process helps me to recognize it as labor and to, to understand um, why they return to it or why it's important. And so I've been trying to think through possibilities for making my, rendering my process uh, more available and open for folks to sort of explore. So as I'm working on this next album, I've been um, you know, filming this kind of like a meta recording of the album happening where I'm filming myself and leaving voice memos and making sure that there are traces of the different parts of the process that when I release the thing, I want to share that as well um, to kind of be these echoes um, and reflection on this thing being constantly like alive that we often receive these commodities and think about them as finished things. The album is done, the book is finished, but thinking about our work as being more alive than that is something I'm invested in trying to have people um, think through. Um, and in many ways, the emergence of these tools has pushed me in that direction. So it's helped me to like run screaming in the other direction, <laughs> if anything, that's how it's shaped my work. That's very interesting. Sarah, do you wanna? Yeah, to, I mean, no, I most immediately, I. I would say that my priority is uh, that there be a requirement that, that people give you know, their consent to having their image um, manipulated or, or used. Um, but stepping back, that's really predicated on people recognizing us as workers um, you know, and uh, working in an industry, in my case, the fashion industry, um, that, you know, uh, where, where people deserve to have rights and protections like anyone else who works for a living. Um, and I think too often when it comes to creative work across industries, it's seen as a privilege, but the fact is that we're doing a job and, and we deserve to have basic rights and protections as workers. Thank you. All right, is there someone in the audience who, right there who has a microphone? Feel free to ask your question. Hi, um, thank you for the great conversation. I could relate to everything you said. Um, I want to make an example and then ask my question. So, um, I am uh, I'm Iranian, Iranian American, and um, since last year that the Iranian feminist revolution started, um, I saw on Twitter that some people are using AI uh, images to envision a future post-Islamic uh, overthrow, and um, this. this this has been just going on. It's like f pictures with our Freedom Tower, women not like uh, wearing hijab or like d diversity represented even superficially in those images, but they were very, um, again, superficial and 
uncomfortable and triggering. So uh, a few weeks ago, one of my friends, who is also an Iranian woman, she, she lives there. I'm, I mean, I have the privilege of being here, but she d doesn't. She asks AI through VPN because they are all filtered in, in Iran. And so everything that AI is learning from Iranian culture, it's through VPN, so from through other countries, like as if she was in Sweden and doing this. So she asked AI to create an image after we overthrow the Islamic regime of women ha being able to wear whatever they want. And that, uh, the pictures that they AI created, men wearing whatever, whatever they want, and women were always portrayed with hijab. And my friend would, okay, no, no hijab on women's head, please. Just <laughs> everyone wears whatever they want. The, again, the images that were created, different setup, different coloring, again, women were wearing hijab. Like, okay, we are, put, like, she was like, we are literally putting our lives on the street to overthrow it, and then we tell they, I know this is not what we want. This is the exact opposite of what we want. It again gives us what thing is the Iranian way. And I'm, my question is, okay, so what you're doing is amazing, like organizing, drafting a bill, doing things through like infrastructure level. However, we do not have that. And my question is, how do we resist, when you say resist it, in, these, in all of these small interactions, the resistance should happen through all of this. How do you resist as a person who is asking AI to create an image? And it is triggering, insulting, racist, and wrong in so many levels. And how do you, like, do you teach AI, do you, like, try to teach it how do you reach out to Nvidia and Google and like Microsoft like this is very messed up and you're actually interfering with our resistance movement with uh, creating these images that are wrong and they can't be accessed through anyone so they are changing the narrative of a revolution just with this superficial image so my question is how do you resist this as a person as a tiny person who do not have any power or any affiliation with all of these big five companies okay that is that is a huge question and thank you thank you for taking this discussion and making it so much bigger it's not just about you know just one occupation or just labor it has these huge global cultural revolutionary um, implications I don't have an answer. I don't know if uh, <laughs> the other panelists want to step in and um, provide any thoughts. I have stuff to share. I can share some. Um, so the companies know, yeah. right? They're, it's not surprising. They they have a lot of money riding on this, and every company it's their you know, like it's their duty to risk analysis, right? Like where are these risks? And these are not um, tools that are showing reality because it is the internet. Not everywhere has internet that is like, not all the photos were represented equally, right? So Iranian woman, it's not surprising. It's going to always visualize in this way. It's not going to show them in a different way. So, and when you do use these tools, you'll start to notice too, like these images that pop up, they look a certain way. And their, their beauty is in a certain way, you know? And even, and it's, it's kind of hard to tell when it's an image and it's kind of hard to tell when they're words too like you know whenever it's a doctor it's he it more often things like that just slip in and we're in relationship it changes us too you know when we're doing it and once we believe stuff it's hard to unbelieve it because it, it's deep you know your belief is set and you got to have like a little wiggle room for you to change your mind about stuff so when it comes to resisting, I think it's Iranian women are already resisting really well, you know? And when it comes to speaking about stuff, it's just saying things like that because the, you know, and there's a little bit of hope to it because when I first started this stuff, I was like, what are we gonna do? You know, like, wow, this is a lot. And the more I stayed in like research for um, AI and like what could go wrong, the more I felt like there was a lot of like good stuff and hope because I met tons and tons of people. It's only when you're just getting into it where you're like, uh-oh. But now, actually, there's thousands of people in academia. There's activists, grassroots movements. There's so much going on of resistance that, that no one is alone in it. The only thing I guess I would, would, I would echo, actually, because you kind of shared it. Um, I remember going to 
a conference um, a few years ago for like internet creatives. And, you know, one of the um, talks, this uh, YouTuber was saying, you know, was explaining that their videos are really scripted even though they seem uh, really natural or like, you know, that it has this sort of personable element, but they were breaking down all the ways that they create that. And in my mind, it was like, yeah, of course. But I, in talking to people, I realized a lot of people didn't have that understanding or relationship with like YouTube or um, social media platforms where the, the sort of like artifice it, they're not reading it as artifice, like they're reading it as a, a sort of truthful projection of this person's life. And so I think in that moment, I recognized that it was important just to state that, just to have more people be aware of the artifice, like that's that's doing important work. So you expressing this, you and, and your friend expressing like, no, this is wrong, and amplifying that, that's work, right? That's allowing other people to build a kind of literacy with these tools that maybe us in the room might have an understanding of, of how to read that, but other folks might not have that, that kind of um, uh, relationship to the materials that they're interfacing with. So I, yeah, the context. So just you sort of amplifying, continuing to say like, nope, this is what the tool is doing. Let's look at it. Um, I think is Im really, really important work kind of for the cultural imaginary. Yeah, I would largely echo what's already been said. And I, um, in your comment, I heard, um, I'm just one person, but like every movement, every petition, any, you know, legislative campaign starts with, I'm just one person. And then you, you know, turn your head and you look at everyone who's in this room who's, you know, shares your concerns. Um, so certainly don't feel like you're powerless. <laughs> I think I, I would just add one example. Recently during the pandemic, a lot of service workers before that point were just, you know, you work at a service job. It's a low wage job, it's meaningless. But then they became very quickly essential workers. And the narrative completely changed very fast. And people started to produce content that showed them being caring towards their delivery worker or, or their grocery worker. And it started to change how people saw things. And I think that creation of additional content just from that, you know, that personal relationship really started to shift the way that we saw um, a set of workers that had been sort of powerless and they were able to leverage that in order to get hazard pay, better protection. So I think there's ways to kind of slowly push that. Um, but um, any, if there is another question from the audience. Thank you for being here today and sharing your stories and perspectives. I'm curious about, um, Sarah, you talked about uh, um, consent as kind of a, a tool for addressing this. I'd like to see if you could unpack that a little bit and share a little bit more of what you see as the promise but limitations of consent. In running our support line, we're hearing from people whose uh, livelihood is, you know, their image, right? Companies um, using their image to, you know, sell products. And um, so if the companies are using people's images without, without their knowledge or, or consent, obviously, um, it puts them in a very vulnerable position and it, it jeopardizes their ability to make a living. It really gets into this question of data, right? If I consent, am I consenting f forever? Am I consenting for, for a specific kind of payment? Um, and so some solutions we've heard is the licensing. But what does that really mean? And then what does consent really look like? Because like, what am I saying yes to? And because you know, within the digi digital sphere, it could be saved in certain ways. It could be used in certain ways that I don't really necessarily understand. And so that's what I'm trying to get to, 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 to understand. Sure, sure. I mean, in, in our industry, we're talking about consent to um, the use of someone's digital replica, manipulation of their digital replica, um, and, uh, and, and pay. Um, and so it's, it's really, it's, it's largely what, um, 
you know, SAG-AFTRA and the Writers Guild have asked for for writers and and performers. I, maybe I would just add there th those who um, don't agree you should consent to bio any biometric information. That that shouldn't happen at all. I think it, it depends on the context maybe in which it's being used. But I just, you know, I think there's a good debate and that's a great space to figure out like what does it mean? What are you consenting to? Particularly if this is your livelihood for a long time. Last question. Um, I was just wondering about um, creating a larger conversation about this and uh, a movement around it because uh, I'm taking a, a class online. around generative AI and it's mostly people who own businesses or work in um, businesses and they're all thinking about how to move forward in this right now. What are the low hanging fruit? For example, uh, in doing uh, design, graphic design work and they are artists and as long as a customer responds to it, that's all they need and that's all they want. So there needs to be a conversation around consumers and uh, uh, conversations around the laws and protections you need to have in place because it's not being planned, but these individually, these companies are thinking and making their strategic plans like 10 years from now, I don't need to put in money in our budgets for a graphic designer or X, Y, and Z, and it's gonna aggregate without us really thinking about it and to just um, displacement and just, changes in our economy and it might be a cycle because consumers might not respond and they realize oh we do need these people but in the meantime there there isn't really there's conversation around safety and inclusion but what about just thinking overall about the impacts and how do we need to educate just ourselves in general as consumers and as um people making decisions around this. Um, and the second question I have is, um, again, around the arts, because I, I do art on my side. <laughs> and I, I came back to it as an adult because I thought there wasn't money in this. But um, it, it takes a lot of time and effort to build a skill, and I'm just worried about the loss of that, the loss of the skill needed to actually draw well, paint well, sculpt, have an eye for, you know, design, et cetera, and yeah. what happens. Thank you. Um, really quickly, I'll say just in terms of the organizing, again, I'll, I'll scream it from the rooftops, United Musicians of Allied and Allied Workers is a group that is really pushing to make connections between uh, workers, not just in the music space, but in other universes, and to you know translate the work that we do, uh, and make sure there's a recognition that we're all invested in similar kind of causes. And I think as part of that, you know, one thing that I return to in this dialogue is is recognizing that the conversations we're having about AI are also conversations about quality of life even outside of that context, right? Like there, we would not be feeling this, experiencing this as the crisis that it is if everyone wasn't so precarious. If like we could have artists who could live with a sense of dignity and not have to feel like they need to concede to working with this tool to have a successful business. And so a lot of the work that I think um, I'm recognizing needs to be supported and kind of done is work that's already taking place around kind of environmental racism and uh, ca organizing against capitalist structures, right? Because that's what the conversation is um, when we extend it outwards, like that's really what we're trying to push back against. And maybe the tool is enabling us to recognize that like that's the discourse or the level of the discourse that we need to be sort of addressing when we're talking about what can this tool do or not do. Right. Um, really quick, uh, look up uh, the writer's strike that happened and how unions got, you know, what happened there. Adam Conover has a really great little, um, like, half an hour thing on it because every, like, a lot of sectors have unions, even when you're independent, you can, like, collectively do those. And I think the secret kind of lies there. And then um, if you come over and, like, just 
I'll give you the names of a whole bunch of different organizations and movements because there's so many to name. But um, you can also like just go on my website and I have like lots of different projects where I am redirecting like a hub people to um, their specific area. Good. All right. Well, thank you so much. Please join me in thanking um, today's panelists, uh, Inango, Lumbamba, Kasango, Sharife Wong, and Sarah Ziff. <laughs>